love everyone. I'm just so excited, y'all, because we are starting our Summer at Vertical series. <laughs> Summer at Vertical, y'all. It's such a fun time because in this series, other leaders and pastors are just going to come up here and we have unique messages for you guys, guaranteed to make this summer like your best summer yet. So if you're not a note taker, you're going to have to be a note taker by the grace of God today. You know what I'm saying? We got points for you that are going to change this summer for the better. Are y'all ready? Listen, I know summer's the season where we're doing housework, we're doing yard work. Y'all bought your mulch already. I hope you got the discount. My parents got like 50 bags of mulch a couple weeks ago, so we are ready. But it's a season where we're just fixing things. Maybe you're trying to get your summer body right, or your yard right, or your house right, or your family right, whatever it is, your goals right, your money right. But how many of y'all know this summer, we got to get our hearts right. We got to grow today. So are y'all ready to grow? All you, got, you got to shout, I'm ready. You got to say, I'm ready loud. Well, y'all are ready. Okay, guys, since we're doing hard work today, that requires a little honesty, a little vulnerability, a little confession. So I got to be real with you guys. Somebody say, be real. I got to be real. And now, if you relate to me, if you share this struggle that I'm about to share, I need you loud and proud, raise your hands, make some noise so I know I'm not the only one out there, but I am a perfectionist. Ooh, where are my perfectionists at? Okay, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I love it. Mama, my people, we're going to make a small group. We're just going to cry about it together. Perfectionism. It sounds like not a bad thing, okay? Like, you're like, girl, there's bigger problems in the world than you like and things being perfect. I know. But perfectionism is rough because it's like everything you do, if it's not perfect, like, it's like everything's going to explode, right? Like, you want to make sure things are done. I'm like trying to be super organized, super on top of things, make sure to, making sure everything is great and everything is good. And if it's not, then you freak out and you're just like, oh, perfectionism. It's crazy. And one of the things that I noticed lately about perfectionism, and I was talking to another perfectionist friend about this. If you don't have a perfectionist friend, get a perfectionist friend. It'll change your life. But I was talking to her about it, and I'm like, you know, the craziest thing that I've noticed lately is how my perfectionism actually can lead to procrastination. Okay, y'all felt that, y'all felt that. You guys understand. It's so weird, okay? It's, it shouldn't be that way. Perfectionism, literally, you just, things are supposed to be perfect, it does not match up with procrastination. Like if you put perfectionist on your resume, you tell your job, I'm a perfectionist. That's not like the worst sounding thing in the world. They're like, okay, like it's not bad. It's not bad. If you call me perfectionist, I won't be upset at you. But don't you dare call me a procrastinator. You know what I mean? Like that, who wants to be called a procrastinator, right? If you tell that on your resume or your job interview, they're going to be like, uh, next please. Like it just doesn't sound good. Like perfectionism is up here, procrastination is down there. But for some reason, perfectionism can lead to procrastination. It's so weird, and I hate procrastination, and I'm a procrastinator, y'all, so all my procrastinators, no shame to you, I'm with you, you're not alone, but it's weird because the things that we think, you know, are going to be like the biggest projects, the scariest projects, you know, I procrastinate personally when I feel like something is too big for me or too hard for me, it's too scary, you know, I don't think I'm enough to be able to complete it, I'm insecure, or anxious about it, right, anybody feel that with procrastination? What's crazy is the things that I procrastinate, and I think are gonna take me forever or be so impossible, end up getting done like this, right? Like they're the weirdest, it's the weirdest thing. They're so small sometimes. And y'all, can I be real about my latest procrastination? I've gotten way better at this recently, still working on it, but texting people back. How many of y'all share that struggle? I, oh, I saw some faces like, oh, don't look at me. Like y'all understand. Like I think when life gets busy, when I'm in a crazy season, when things get overwhelming and I'm stressed, like if I see my text messages, like they gonna pile up. Cause I'm the kind of person, I get distracted easy. So if I see a message and it's about another project I have to do, I'm crying. Like it's too much. Like it's just, I'm gonna be like, oh my gosh, now I have to fix this and worry about this. Anybody feel me? Like, it gets crazy sometimes. And there was one time where my good friend and someone that I lead here with and serve here with, she sent me a voice memo. And now the anxiety set in, okay? This was during a week where I was fragile. Like, I was going through it. It was a stressful, busy week. Things are getting kind of hectic and crazy. And I was like, oh, God, no. Like, what is she saying to me in this voice memo? My first thought for all my panickers in the house, like, I was like, oh, my God, like, is it going to be more work? Is it going to be another distraction? Am I going to have to fix something in the last minute? Like, what is it going to be? Am I going to get thrown off? Is this, like, 10 more projects to add to my 20 projects? Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, it was crazy. And what's funny is, and life hack for all my people that are bad at texting back, 
Apple released this feature on your iPhone where you could open the text messages and then mark it as read. So you don't miss your notification, you could go back to it later. So my hack has been, I'm gonna open the voice memo. If it's like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, no big deal. I'll listen to it, it's probably something nice, whatever. Tell me why it was like a three minute, five minute voice memo. I was so afraid and the anxiety went from here to here. I was like, oh my gosh. And I procrastinated listening to that message for the longest time, guys. Like I pushed it off, I was so afraid. And can you guess what that voice message was when I finally got around to listening to it? It was the most encouraging, sweetest, cutest message. She was just telling me a testimony. She was encouraging me. And here I was being anxious this whole time. Like, can we talk about procrastination for a second? It disguises itself as a self-defense mechanism when it's actually self-sabotage. It's actually self-sabotage, because how many of y'all know that the more you procrastinate, right, we think, oh, if I push away this big bad project or this conversation or this person that I'm avoiding talking to, like, you know, it, it'll just solve itself. The problem will go away. But now with procrastination, the longer you avoid, the longer you push back, the longer you hide from it and run from it, the worse you feel, the more anxious you get, the more afraid and stressed out you are. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Procrastinators in the house, like it just doesn't make things better. And now again, if you procrastinate, no shame. I'm with you. We're going to grow in this together. I got you. And maybe for you, procrastination, excuse me, maybe for you, procrastination looks like procrastinating on that lawn work. Oh, some of y'all got some chores you've been putting off for a while. I know maybe it looks like procrastinating a tough conversation. You've been pushing it off. Maybe it looks like procrastinating a job application. Or my college people at, maybe you've been procrastinating on some assignments. Get them done. I mean, I know it's summer now, but when you have, get them done. And maybe you've been procrastinating on starting that new project. And whatever your procrastination is, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, if there's one thing you cannot afford to procrastinate on this summer, if you cannot afford to procrastinate on it in life, you cannot afford to procrastinate your purpose. You cannot afford to procrastinate your purpose. If I had a title today's message, guys, and you could write this down, I would say, don't procrastinate your purpose. Don't procrastinate your purpose. And today, as you come into this building, I want you guys to know, without a doubt, you are loved, you are seen, and you have purpose. Did you know that, that God has a purpose for your life? I want you to read this verse with me, Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10, check it out up here. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Oh, we could just stop right there for a second. Somebody needs to catch that. You are God's masterpiece. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you came from. I don't know what you've done or what you've been through or what other people have said about you or how they've tried to label you. You are God's masterpiece. You could say amen to that. You are God's masterpiece today. We are his masterpiece, created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do what? The good things he planned for us long ago. See, God has good things planned for your life. You who is 85 and you who is 18, you who is new to the faith and never came to church before, maybe this is your first time here, or you who's been a warrior in the faith for years. Whoever you are, whatever stage of life you're in, God has a purpose for your life. You are designed for good things. And I love this because when God has a God dream for your life, like you know it's gonna be big. All of you in this place, maybe you're looking at me right now and you're like, mm, I don't feel it. That's okay. God has a plan for your life, for your life, for your life, for your life. And when God's hand is on it, it's going to be huge because his plans are exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. And at some point in your life, God's going to come calling. He's going to come knocking. There's going to be a time where he, those plans need to start coming to pass. And maybe that's going to look like a life calling. You know, when I was 18, I knew I was called to do ministry for the rest of my life. Maybe God is calling you to be a father or a mother. Maybe God is calling you to a specific career path for your life. Or maybe when God comes calling, it's gonna look like a seasonal calling, like an act of obedience in a certain season. Maybe he's gonna call you to say no to taking that extra overtime and all those extra meetings so you can say yes to investing in your marriage and your children. Maybe God is gonna call you to say no to going out so you can say yes to more generosity. 
Oh, come on, maybe God is going to call you to start taking some classes so you can learn a new skill for this season. Whatever it is, whether it's a life calling or a seasonal calling, at some point, God will come calling. And if he hasn't already, you just wait. It's coming. He's going to call. But what happens is I think our tendency a lot of times when God comes calling is we start procrastinating. Oh, y'all felt that? Anybody been called before and you're like, whoa, God, hold up. Like you're calling me to do what? You want me to do to do that? Maybe you heard this last series and you were inspired to make a change, but you were like, whoa, 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 God, that's a lot of work. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? See, at its core, procrastination is the putting off an assignment because of feelings of fear, insecurity, anxiety. It's outside of my comfort zone. I don't feel enough to do that. And when it comes to procrastinating our purpose, the problem is that, like procrastination, many of us put off our assignment, our calling, our purpose, because we are afraid or insecure or it's outside of our comfort zone, God. I don't feel enough for this thing, Jesus. What if I take that job and then I lose it? What if I take that job and I don't have enough time over here? What if I say yes to giving you uh, more offerings and being more generous and then I don't have enough to take care of my family? What if you call me to go into this career path and I completely flop? Oh, anybody ever felt these worries before? We tend to procrastinate the calling. But here at Summer of Vertical, guys, we are going to break this today. I want to help you guys break out of these fears, break out of those worries, and to walk in the purpose and the calling that God has for your life. And so today, whatever notes you're taking, I need you to save them. Because if he hasn't called you yet, again, the time will come. He's going to come calling. And so to inspire you, to encourage you, to help you today, I want to tell you about a man named Moses. Y'all ready to hear about some Moses stories? So in this point of the story that I'm going to share with you, Moses is just a regular guy. He's a shepherd. He's working in the family business like many of you all here today. He is married. He has children. He's doing his shepherding thing in a land named Midian. And then he was called by God. Check this out in Exodus 3, 1 through 10. It says, now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Crazy. And so Moses, he saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so he thought, I got to go over and see this. I got to go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn. And I love this part because I can't help but think and wonder if Moses knew on this ordinary day, at his ordinary job, in his ordinary life, that he was stumbling onto the mountain of God, that he was walking into an encounter that God was about to call him. And I love it because I wonder how many of you today online and in the house came to church today and didn't even realize you were about to step into an encounter with God, that you were about to step into a place of hope, that you were about to step into a place of healing, that you were about to step into a place of freedom, that God was gonna move. And so look, God in verse four says, when the Lord saw that he had come over, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Like, could you imagine you hear God's voice from a bush? You're like, whoa, 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 what's happening? And so God begins to reveal his identity to Moses and he tells him a mission that he has for his life. See, in this time, the Israelites, they were God's chosen people. They were a nation, but unfortunately they were enslaved by the Egyptians. And so for years, the Israelites are living now under brutal, harsh conditions. And at one point, it was so bad, in fact, that the Israelites kept populating and growing in number. And the Egyptians didn't want to be overtaken. So now the Pharaoh, the Egyptian ruler, orders that all the Israelite or Hebrew boys have to be slain so that they don't grow. This is the harsh reality of God's people that they're living in today. Or not today, excuse me, in the story. And so what happens is God says, I have seen their suffering. I have seen their harsh conditions. I have heard their cries and I am going to save them. I am going to rescue them. I am going to set them free. And watch what he says next to Moses. Verse 10, God says, so now go. What? So now go, he says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Could you imagine you're at your... Independence Day, 4th of July cookout, and God is now calling you to set a nation free. Could you imagine the weight of this, y'all? Oh, you guys got to catch it. Could you imagine the weight of this? 
the impact if you're just doing your ordinary day-to-day life and out of nowhere, God's calling you to lead a nation and you're like, God, I'm just a shepherd. I lead sheep, not people. Like it's a crazy, crazy calling. And what makes this calling even crazier is Moses' past. You see, because what I didn't tell you at first is that Moses wasn't always a shepherd. And Midian was not actually his home. It was his hiding place. See, Moses was in hiding. Moses was in running. And back then, Moses, when he was born, he was actually an Israelite Hebrew boy born into that slavery. He was one of the boys that should not have made it. He was one of the boys that should have been slain. But his mother, and shout out to the strong mothers in the room and online, come on, we love you moms. But his mother hides him in a basket, puts him in the Nile River, hoping with faith that the Lord would keep her child alive. And I love how God works because guess whose house he falls into? Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses keeps him for her own as her own son. And now Moses, this Hebrew slave boy who should have been killed is now being raised up in the royal palace of the people that were hurting his people. And in fact, when he grows up, if that wasn't even crazy enough, there's one day in Exodus 2, 11, where it says after he had grown, he went out from where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. How could you imagine seeing that brutality? He watches them and he sees an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. This is the Moses God is calling. He kills him, he hides him, and the next day he sees two more Hebrew men fighting and he says, man, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses too. But Moses fled and that's how he ended up in Midian. So could you imagine how Moses feels when the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth is before him, calling him to free the same people that he was rejected by, that he was running from, that he just felt set apart from, this very Moses that was insecure, this Moses that was rejected, this Moses that was a murderer, this Moses that was in hiding, the Moses of guilt and shame. This is the one God is calling. And I wonder, How many of us feel like Moses in this room today? Where God is calling and we're like, Lord, do you see who I am? Do you know me? And I know Moses was procrastinating real bad in this moment when God called him because he says four things to God. And I want you to write these four things down to think about them, to catch them. Because if you say these four things to God when he calls you, you're probably procrastinating too. And no shame because I have said all of these things. Number one, Moses says, who am I? Who am I? Oh, anybody said that to God before when he called you like, Lord, who am I? Exodus 3.11 says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go out to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I bet he's thinking, God, you, you do remember what I did, right? You do remember what they spoke over me, right? You do remember that they rejected me and that I was in hiding because I killed someone and now they want to kill me, right? You're sending me to do this? Anybody ever felt that before where God has called you and you're like, Lord, do you know my story? Like almost like, God, are you sure you're not making a mistake with me? Anybody felt that before? You can lift your hands if you felt that before. I've been that way. And the second thing Moses says is, what if? Oh, where are my warriors in the house? Come on. All the warriors, I feel you. We love to say, what if, what if, what if? Moses says, what if? See, he continues to ask God all these questions about what to say and about how God is going to show up and move and if the people are going to believe in him and God is giving him the best explanation ever. And he's still like, what if? And in Exodus 4, 1, Moses answers, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? I bet he's thinking, God, you remember they rejected me, right? They didn't want to listen to me. I tried to stop their fighting and they didn't want to listen. I don't have authority with these people. I feel like some of y'all in this room are probably like, God, what if I say yes to you and it falls apart? What if I do what you call me to do and nothing changes? What if I step out and I get embarrassed and I fall flat on my face? Anybody ask these what if questions before? Have you been there before? Oh, anybody been there before? Come on, you've been there before. Asking what if, God? What if I put my trust in you and then the thing doesn't change? What if I take that job and it's still the same response? What if I get stuck? What if I give to you and I don't have enough? 
We ask the what if questions. And number three is I have never been or I am not. I love this one because Moses is speaking to God in Exodus 4.10 and he says, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. He's like, God, I have a stutter. God, I can't speak. First of all, you want me to lead these people, but I'm not even a good speaker. Anybody ever felt like that before you told God, like, Lord, I'm not who you think I am. I don't have the skills. I don't have the qualifications. I don't have the degree. Come on, somebody. I don't have the background. I don't have the experience. I don't come from that kind of family. I'm not that kind of person. God, I don't like people. Why are you calling me to love them? Like, anybody felt that before? God, this is not who I am. God, it's not who I am. I've never been smart. I've never been a good leader. I've never been attractive to people. I've never been intelligent with these things. I've never been good at decision making. Whatever that never been has for you, Moses felt the worries. And lastly, I love this last part that Moses says to God because he's just straight up with it. Exodus 4.13, he says, God, send someone else. Oh, y'all said that before, right? Huh? Like anybody been there before? We can be honest. It can be real. There's no shame in the building. I've done it. I think we've all done it where God calls and you're like, whoa, 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 buddy. Send someone else. That's not me. I don't, I don't, I don't do that, God. Like that's not for me. I'm not about that life. Like I, didn't, I wasn't raised that way. I don't have that. What you think I have. I'm not who you think I am. Just send someone else. Moses wanted God to send someone else. But I want to encourage you guys today that if that is you, if you're asking those questions, if you're feeling those things, if maybe you're feeling like Moses today, like you have a past, you have a story, you got some things that have put you into hiding, you got some things that have put you into fear, you got some things where God is calling you to and you're just like, God, I'm not the one. What if I've never been? I am not. Lord, send someone else. I want to encourage you that God can still use you today. There is no sin, there's no sin or shame that he cannot heal you from. There is no sin too big for him to forgive. There is no one that he cannot love. There's no past that he cannot use. Come on, you got to catch that. This morning, I need to hear you, Vertical Church. He can use you. He loves you. You're never too far gone for God. Maybe you think you're past your prime. Moses, in this point of the story, was probably in his 80s, and God's calling him. You're never too far gone for God. He can use you. He can use you. He can use you. He can use you. Whoever you are, whatever you think you might lack, God can use you today. Be encouraged, my friends. And I need you to write this part down. Take note of this because this is what's going to change your procrastination, the game of procrastination. You see, God's calling will always be outside of your comfort zone. God's calling will always be outside of your comfort zone but it's always gonna be within your potential. Always within your potential. I'm looking at a room full of incredible potential. See, like we said in the beginning, Ephesians 2.10, God has designed us for good works that he planned for us long ago. And Isaiah 55, eight through nine says that the Lord's ways are higher. His thoughts are greater. So again, when he has a plan for your life, oh, you know it's not gonna be small. He has a big plan, a mighty plan, a powerful plan that is beyond anything you could ask or imagine. And so it's gonna be great and it's gonna be huge. And I, I love it because I hear people say that if God you know, gives you a dream and you can do it on your own, it's not a God dream. Ooh, it's not a God dream. You need God's strength. You're going to need his support. You're going to need his provision, his power. But he has a dream for your life, and it's beyond what you can imagine. But, again, he created you for this. It's within you. You have the potential. But the dangerous part with procrastination is, is if we procrastinate our purpose, we'll get stuck in that potential. We'll get stuck in that potential. I love thinking about it this way. Pastor Chad Vichy says, potential is a cuss word. Like, you don't want to look at somebody and be like, oh, they have potential. Like, it just doesn't feel good. It doesn't sound good. Potential is what you could be but never became. Oof. That's not a label we want to have, right? We want to be some people that become, some people that do, some people that experience the plan of God in our life. See, potential is like a seed just sitting in a drawer. Oh, I got to tell you guys this. This um, past few summers ago, I got real excited about planting. You know, it's just that kind of summer and you just suddenly inspired to plant and grow everything. Like you think you're about to be the next gardening queen, whatever it is. And so I got these plant seed packets from the store and I was going to grow cucumbers and tomatoes and I got sunflower seeds, everything. And me and my parents were real excited about it. And I took those seed packets 
and I put them in the junk drawer. And you know that junk drawer, nothing you put in there is about to come out. Like it's not a good place to store things that you want to work on. And so I put it in the drawer and days go by and then weeks go by and then months go by. And what do you think those seeds were doing? They were sitting in that drawer, that's right. They were locked up in that drawer. And that's exactly the image of potential because all this time they could have been blooming, they could have been bearing fruit, they could have been producing, they could have been bearing good things and growing up and flourishing. And all this time, they're sitting in a drawer, all the potential in the world and no fruit. And church, that's not how we're supposed to be today. We are not going to be all potential and no fruit. We're not going to be all potential and no fulfilled purpose. We're not going to be all potential, all procrastination, all excuses, all anxieties, all fears, and never walking in the plans that God has for us, y'all. Because again, he has a plan for your life. And so maybe you're looking at me like, Raya, girl, how do I do this then? How do I break this procrastination? How do I unleash this potential? Because again, potential isn't unleashed until an action occurs. Well, I want to tell you this one. The key to unleashing your potential is not your perfection, it's God's power. It's not your perfection, it's God's power. Think of where we get it wrong a lot of times in churches. We think we need to be perfect before God can use us. We think we need to be spotless before we can come before the Lord and, and worship him and praise him. And we think we have to have never sinned, never cussed, never fought nobody, never said nothing bad, never thought nothing crazy, never lied. That we have to be the most perfect speakers, the most perfect athletes, the most perfect husbands, the most perfect wives. Come on. We think we got to be perfect before he can use us. God doesn't need your perfection you just need his power. You just need his power. God does not call perfect people, Vertical Church. He calls purposed people. And we are all purposed in this room. We all have a purpose. So write this down, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. You gotta like, highlight this verse, catch it, circle it all the way up. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, God is speaking to this man named Paul, again, another purposed person who's going through it. And look what God says. This will change your life if you believe it. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Woo, my grace is sufficient for you for my what? My power. Somebody say power. Say it with power, say power. power. My power is made perfect in weakness. Later on, he says, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Church, we got to grab that identity today. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. I don't have to be perfect for God to use me. I don't have to be the best at this thing for him to call me to this career path. I don't have to be a perfect wife or a perfect mother. God, you can use me how I am in my brokenness. Did you know that your pain and your past can be a platform for his glory? Guys, he has a purpose for you. You don't need to be perfect. You need his power. And if you need more proof, I got you right here. Look at how God responds to Moses. And if you were the person, you're asking those four questions and the things that Moses said, if you're procrastinating your purpose, if you're nervous or living in some fear around how God is calling you, I need you to catch this. I need you to catch what God says to you. First, when Moses says, who am I? God says, I will be with you. Ooh, catch that today, guys. He says, I will be with you. Exodus 3, 11 through 12, when Moses is like, who am I that I should go and lead these people? God said, I'll be with you. And God even gave him a sign. See guys, the power is in the presence. The power is in the presence. We do not walk alone. If you've put your trust in Jesus, we know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we, when we got the Holy Spirit inside of us, we got the power of God inside of us. That God is moving, God is breathing. And what I love about God too is when he's with us, y'all, we have everything we need. Psalm 23, one said, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Did you know that you lack nothing when you believe in your father, God? Because not only is God, God, God is our father. He is our provider. He's our protector. He's our healer. He's our shepherd. He's our rock. He's our strong tower. He is our wisdom. He is our peace. He is our freedom. He is our healing. Whatever you need. He is with you. So wherever God calls you, don't be afraid. Don't ask who am I that I should do this. Look at who he is. Look at who he is. He is the I am. And number two, when Moses says what if, ah, this is my favorite, y'all. When Moses says what if, God says, what is? 
What is? See, Moses is saying, God, what if they don't believe me? And God says, Moses, well, what is in your hand? Moses was carrying a staff. And so God said, Moses, throw down that staff. And when you throw it down, it's gonna become a miraculous sign that will prove to them that I'm with you. And what I need you to catch from that today is sometimes we're insecure and afraid to live out the calling of God on our lives because we don't think we have enough, that we don't think God can do it, but we look at all the things we lack and God says, well, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? You maybe not have a million dollars to be generous, but you got a couple bucks. What's in your hand? You might not have the perfect language and the perfect education, but what's in your hand? You might not have that degree, like me, listen, I'm working in a field where I don't have a degree for it, but listen, God, I got YouTube, I had a couple classes in high school, and I was like, God, I can't do this, I'm not qualified. He said, what's in your hand? You've got something. Maybe you feel like, God, well, what if I can't be the best mother? Well, what's in your hand? Take what you have, God can use it. He used five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 and left leftovers. <laughs> Let him use your little. God can do much with what you think is not enough. In fact, he can do more than enough with what you think is not enough. So whenever you want to ask what if, look at what God says. Well, what is, what do I have? God, what can I give you? And he can multiply it. He is that good. So what is in your hand? It is enough. And number three, when Moses says, God, I have never been and I am not. Church, when we say I've never been and I am not, God says, I am. Whew. Exodus 4, 10 through 12, Moses is telling God, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past or since you've spoken to me now. I'm not good with speech. I have a stutter. I can't speak right like the good leaders can. I can't speak like Pastor Ken can. I can't speak like that television person can. I can't do what you've called me to do. And watch what God says in verse 11. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or make them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And I don't think he's being sassy to Moses. He's just saying, Moses, remember me. Remember who I am. Don't look at who you're not. Look at who I am. He says, now go. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Church, God's grace is enough to fill your gaps. Everything you think you are not, that's okay. God is. If you're not compassionate, if you struggle with generosity, we serve the God who's super generous and compassionate. If you don't think you're a great speaker, we serve the God who made your tongue and your mind and your mouth and who can give you the words to speak. If you don't think you're gonna be a great parent, God is the ultimate father and he'll give you the capacity to parent your children. God is, God is, God is. Stop saying you're not and look who he is. He doesn't need your perfection. He doesn't need you to be perfect. He doesn't need you to have it all together. He just needs you to trust in who he is and let him move through you. Look at who he is. His grace can fill your gaps. And number four, when we say send someone else, God's like, mm -mm, no, no, but I'll send someone to help you. I'll send someone to help you. Exodus 4, 13 through 15, Moses is like, God, please send someone else. I can't do this. And God is like, mm -mm, I still need you to do it, but I know you have a brother named Aaron. In verse 15, he says, you shall speak to Aaron and put words in his mouth and I'll help both of you speak and teach you what to do. <laughs> See, as much as we try, we cannot escape God's calling, y'all. I know it's scary. I know it's uncomfortable. God has called me to a lot of positions and, and leadership things. And I'm like, Lord, I am not qualified for this. Like, I can't do this. But he's always placed the right mentors and the right leaders and the right people in my path to hold me fast, to hold me strong, to give me mentorship and to coach me and to grow me and to mold me and to shape me and to hold my hands high and to give me confidence when I feel insecure and weak, y'all. Imposter syndrome hits me on a daily but God will put the right people in your path to shift your mindset, to help you walk it out. Maybe you gotta join a small group, find some other procrastinators, and then get a leader who's overcome procrastination and walk it out together. Walk it out together. God will give you the people to help you grow. So this summer, guys, don't procrastinate your purpose. When the time comes, if it hasn't already, when God calls you for a season, when he calls you for a lifestyle, press in. Take that step outside of your comfort zone. Take that step beyond your fears. Take that step in faith and watch what God will do through you. Because now let me tell you the end of Moses' story. 
See, though Moses was a murderer and uh, bad with speech and he was just a shepherd and he was in hiding and he had shame and a dirty past and a lot of struggles and he was insecure and afraid, he took that leap of faith. And Moses went on to be one of the most famous, well-known Christian leaders in history. He led the people out of their slavery and brought them to the promised land of God. He performed miracle after miracle after miracle. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. You think your past is too crazy. Now God can use you. God can use you. 